In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Welcome everyone to our first Saturday devotions once again. In recent first Saturdays, the conferences that we've had have been meditating upon the three glorious mysteries of the Rosary, the Resurrection, the Ascension, and the Descent of the Holy Spirit, as was appropriate during the recent Easter season. So now to continue this, we're going to turn to the last two glorious mysteries, the Assumption and the Coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Both of these are celebrated um, liturgically in the church during its calendar next month, on August the 15th and August the 22nd, respectively. So today, I will reflect upon the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and then we will conclude this series of talks on the Glorious Mysteries next month with the final and fifth Glorious Mystery, the Coronation. Now, the solemnity of the Assumption is a very important solemnity in the Church. In Australia, it is one of the very few holy days of obligations, days when all Catholics are required to go to Mass. The other days, the other holy days of obligation in Australia are all the Sundays of the year and Christmas Day. They're the only holy days of obligation, Sundays, Christmas Day, and the Assumption. So this solemnity in the church is a very significant one. It's a one upon what a lot of weight is put, and it is also the fourth glorious mystery on which we meditate today. So the Assumption is also important as one of four Marian dogmas given by the Church. Right? The other dogmas being the Divine Motherhood of Mary, that of the Perpetual Virginity of Mary, and that of the Immaculate Conception. So a dogma means it's something that the Church has definitively defined as something that all Catholics believe. So the dogmas of the Immaculate Conception, which was defined in 1854, and the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, defined in 1950, are kind of unique in the history of the Church. Normally, dogmas are only given in response to a heresy. So somebody comes along and denies something that was universally believed by all Catholics up until that point. So, for example, in the early church, there were many dogmas issued about the divinity of Christ because somebody would come along and deny that he was truly man, or somebody would come along and deny he was truly God, or somebody would come along and deny that he was equal to the Father. So we would have a dogma issued by the church about this to reaffirm the teaching of the church, that Christ is part of the Trinity, equal to God the Father, a truly Son, uh, truly divine and truly man. So, m many things that we believe as Catholics aren't necessarily dogmatically defined. We believe them, but nobody's ever challenged it with a heresy, so it never got dogmatically defined. Both of these Marian dogmas were not defined in response to a heresy. Rather, it was by popular demand and popular piety of the faithful, stemming from a desire to express their devotion to Mary. So uniquely among the dogmas of the Church, the two about the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception, they were kind of defined as an honour given to the Blessed Virgin Mary expressing the ancient belief of the church, but not in response to a heresy. It's also important to understand something, some of what is held by the teaching of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's sometimes not as well understood as, as it should be. I was once, for example, trying to explain the Assumption to a non-Catholic friend in front of another seminarian. 
And it was the other seminarian that expressed surprise at what I was saying because he didn't properly understand the feast before that. He didn't realize what I was saying was what the church um, held. He was fairly ignorant of, of, of um, the solemnity and its meaning. So the word assumption means a taking up. So Mary is taken up to heaven. This is as opposed to the ascension, which we meditate upon in the second glorious mystery, the ascension of Christ into heaven. Ascension means a going up. So Jesus ascended to heaven by his own power and might to sit where he was before at the right hand of God. It's by his own might and his own power that he takes a place that is rightly his, that is his for the taking. That's what it means when Jesus ascends to heaven. By contrast with the assumption, it is Mary being taken up by the grace and power of God. It's God that takes Mary up to heaven. At the ascension of Christ, he takes what is his by right, by his own power. At the assumption, Mary is given a great blessing and a privilege by God. It's not something that she takes of her own accord. It's something that God gives to her as an incredible grace and blessing. There is with the assumption, though, a question that is left wide open. And that's the question of if Mary died or whether she was raised to eternal life without bodily death. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, which calls the feast the Domitian or falling asleep of the mother of God leads strongly towards her having died. There is an apocryphal story of the apostles opening her tomb to allow Thomas, who was absent, again, to pay his respects, only to find that the tomb was empty and therefore them concluding that God took her body and soul into heaven. There's also a tradition that works on the thought that death is the consequence of sin. And Mary, being immaculately conceived and therefore free from all sin, she should also be free from all death. So as God gave her this great grace of being immaculately conceived without original sin and never having fallen into personal sin herself, the tradition goes, well, therefore, if she wasn't guilty of sin, she shouldn't ever have suffered the effects of sin. And I personally want to hold this, um, particularly as it doesn't seem without precedent. Um, if you read in the Old Testament, for example, it seems to apply, imply that both Enoch and Elijah entered the next life without dying. We're told if you go and read Genesis and read about Enoch, it says that he reached a certain age and then he walked with God. Everybody else in that, path, in that section, it says they died at a certain age. Enoch reaches a certain age and then he walked with God. Elijah, if you remember the story, um, Elijah in front of Elisha is taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot, um, both kind of implying that both of them went to eternal life without dying. And I think if God would give that honor to two of the great prophets of the Old Testament, I think it would be very fitting that he also gave this honor and blessing to his, to his blessed mother. Of course, the difference being that here he's taking her body and soul directly into eternal life, whereas they would have to wait for that to be fully realized till the end of time. When we're talking about, you know, scriptural basis then for the assumption, there's a number of scriptural passages that are quoted as relevant. Um, the first is Revelation chapter 12, verse one. Um, and that's the famous one that goes, a great potent appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, a moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. This is an image that has multiple meanings. It's often taken as a reference to the church as well, but it has also been taken as a reference to Mary, and particularly to the glory that is hers 
after being assumed into heaven and then later crowned queen of heaven because she's pictured with a crown of 12 stars. And a lot of this has certain symbolism. Um, you know, the 12 stars is often associated with the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 apostles. Sometimes also quoted when talking about this verse is the preceding verse, which I feel um, because of the later editions of the chapters dividing up um, the books of the Bible, um, this was one of those unfortunate divisions that kind of cut it off because I think it's better together because both seem to expressing the same idea in the same way as the Psalms, two lines will repeat the same idea in order to complement and enhance. If you're reading the Psalms and paying attention, um, you know, um, you will see that you'll have two lines that express an idea, and then the next two lines will express the same idea again in different words. This is a very common um, method of, of Jewish poetry to express two ideas, one after another, in different ways and in different words as a poetic method. But the preceding verse before Revelation um, 12.1, so this is Revelation 11.19, um, says this, then God's, then God's temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, pearls of thunder and earthquake and heavenly hail, which would then follow with a great potent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. If we read these together, it makes the Ark of the Covenant seen in heaven and the great potent, the woman clothed with the sun, as the same thing and the same person. And, and I like that because I, I love the image of Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. And Mary as the Ark of the Covenant is the reason that she's given this great honor of being assumed into heaven. Um, so if you go back to the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, so this was um, the Ark that contained um, three, three symbols of God and his relationship with his people. So the first that was in the, um, in the Ark of the Covenant was a jar of ma manna, so the bread come down from heaven that Moses um, was instructed to give to the people of Israel while they were wandering through the desert, so God's gift of bread from heaven. Um, the second that was put in the Ark of the Covenant was the staff of Aaron. So if you remember um, with Aaron, um, he had his priestly staff. So for example, when he's before Pharaoh, he throws the staff on the ground, it turns into a snake and it swallows up the other staffs that by witchcraft, um, the, the magicians of, of Pharaoh had also turned into snakes, right? Um, and the staff of Aaron had a number of other um, roles to play in, in that Exodus story, and it becomes a symbol of his priestly power. So we have also in the Ark of the Covenant that symbol of Aaron's priestly power. The third that was put into the Ark of the Covenant is the tablet of the Ten Commandments, so the word of God to his people. And so Mary is then also expressed as the Ark of the New and Eternal Covenant. So Mary in her womb then carries um, Christ, who is first the bread come down from heaven, same as the manna, um, the Eucharist. Right, the second, um, he's the new and eternal high priest, so parallels with the staff of Aaron, the, the symbol of um, priesthood. And third, he is the word became man, um, as paralleled with the uh, Ten Commandments, God's word to his people. So Mary is often spoken about as the ark of the new covenant, the one that carried carried Christ. And that's why I like reading these two verses that are unfortunately split over two chapters together. So seeing the Ark of the Covenant that appears in God's temple and the woman clothed with the sun as the one and the same thing, um, Our Lady, who's given these great blessings um, and for them, 
for her unique role in salvation history um, is, is given this blessing of being assumed into heaven. Um, then this image of Our Lady being assumed into heaven is taken as a fulfillment of of Genesis 3.15. So Genesis 3.15 is where um, having cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, um, the de uh, God as um, a, a curse on the devil says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and her seed. She will crush thy head and thou shall wait for her heel. And we see, in a sense, with the assumption, the final and complete realization of that, of Our Lady fully triumphing over the devil, avoiding um, any stain of sin through this life, and avoiding the consequences of sin as well, with God taking her up, body and soul, into eternal life. So the assumption being the moment when this age-old promise of God is finally fulfilled. Also with the assumption of Mary, as much as it is a unique and special blessing given to Our Lady for her holiness and her central role in salvation history, being the mother of God, being the one that carried Christ, and her, you know, uh, and... You know, it's also a promise of new life that will be given to us when at the end of time we shall also um, be raised to eternal life in heaven, body and soul, as we face the final judgment um, and then have our, the joy of our souls being reunited with our glorious bodies and so take up with Mary our places in the glory of heaven with God for all eternity. The Assumption of Mary is kind of humanity's first foretaste of that promise that God makes to all of us, that we who um, live good and holy lives, faithful to Christ, if we preserve in that, God will raise us also, body and soul, into eternal life. Now, Mary gets the great privilege of that without ever having to have her body suffer bodily decay. She is raised there at either the moment before her death or the moment after her death. She has taken body and soul into heaven as is fitting for her place as the mother of Christ. But it is also humanity's foretaste, promise, that we too will receive this blessing that what God has promised to those that are faithful to him, we will receive as well. But it's also a sobering thought that Mary received this blessing because of her sinlessness. We have to also strive, and the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary reminds that, us of that, that we need to be sinless as by the grace of God we can be or at least take what we still fall into to confession to have it cleaned away. Mary merited this great blessing for her cooperation with the will of God. And by remaining always without that stain of sin in our soul, we who want to receive that same blessing in a slightly lesser form are also called upon to strive to have our souls at the moment of our death to be indeed clean of all at least grave sin if we wish to follow where Mary has gone before. God has made a guarantee of that great promise to us by having already done it to the mother of his son, bestowing on her the full rewards of the redemption that Christ won for all of us. But we, Christ's faithful, who desire this same privilege of entering eternal life, it's not our right. It's not something we demand from God, but it's something that God, as our 
loving Creator gives to us, but we need to uphold our side of that. And that means seeking, seeking to live lives that are good and holy as Our Lady was. And then we, like her, will indeed be raised body and soul to eternal life with Mary, Christ, our Lord, and all the saints for all eternity. So now we turn to our time for silent adoration. So again, this is a time to fulfill Our Lady's request on the first Saturdays to meditate upon one of the mysteries of the Rosary. Um, of course, the Assumption, having been the topic of our talk today, would be an appropriate, an appropriate mystery of the Rosary to spend some time um, meditating upon to fulfill this request of Our Lady. Amen.